Inside Number Nine's continued success is nothing short of a miracle. Every cynical critic of the cultural landscape such as myself always bemoans the fact that things that are popular always take precedence in public consciousness over things that are experimental and daring. And while Inside Number Nine may be less popular than most TV shows, given that it's made it all the way to Series 6, you can't call it underappreciated. Something as odd and out of left field as Inside Number 9 would in any other universe have been cancelled around Series 3, if that, and been destined to become a cult hit among odd neck-bearded people who pester Shearsmith and Pemberton at conventions 20 years from now. But the fact it's been solidly serving an established fanbase for six series, and fortunately keeps getting recommissioned, does prove that something about the modern TV industry must be working, because nothing about this show is conventional. It's an anthology show with no recurring characters for an audience to latch onto. Alright, fine. Anthology shows can get popular, but Inside Number 9 doesn't even stick to one genre. It just sort of drifts between its incredibly varied interests. Of course, it does have its rules and limitations, as every series does, and its format is familiar by this point. And the obvious concern, of course, is that staying fresh in this or indeed any format is going to be difficult if a show's going to end up lasting this long. We are expecting twists and turns now, and if you're expecting something unexpected, it's not really unexpected anymore, is it? While Series 6 does ever so slightly suffer from the established viewer going into most episodes sizing them up and figuring out the sort of conclusion that we're likely to reach, fortunately Shearsmith and Pemberton's talents as writers and performers are unparalleled, and no matter what story they're telling, it's going to be highly engaging and full of colourful characters, great concepts and clever plots. And also, they've completely fucked over any potential critics that will have figured out what they're doing by this point who try to make that point that I half-heartedly acknowledged just there by delivering the most obtuse opening episode they could have possibly written. If the Series 4 opener, being an out-and-out modern-day Shakespearean comedy, was a purposefully off-putting introduction to potential new audience members tuning in for the first time, the opening episode of Series 6, Wuthering Heist, is even more of a curveball than that. As the name implies, it's a mini heist movie that utilises the 16th century form of Italian theatre, Commedia dell'arte. Which, yes, I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly, sue me. This type of theatre where exaggerated character types are made recognisable through the use of face masks is something that drama students will be familiar with, and it's used here to allow the narrative to be as loose and informal as possible, and also to just baffle the audience into submission. By using Commedia dell'arte in partnership with the broad and generic trappings of a heist movie, it gives the episode the appearance of being an improv session. And by making it feel improvisational, it becomes impossible to see where it's going. Twists and turns will just come out of nowhere, a character breaks the fourth wall and comments on the entire thing, and the episode spends so much time basically pummeling the audience into submission that it becomes completely impossible to analyse in any meaningful way. I laughed a fair bit, but it is more obtuse than most of their previous experiments, and it's more of a baffling watch than it is an enjoyable one. But it is obviously a deliberate way of addressing the have they run out of ideas yet question with the answer, no we haven't, fuck off. They would have known that people would have had this reaction to Wuthering Heist, and they even address that. It's a sort of cross between Commedia dell'arte and a heist movie. I guess because they both use masks. It still sounds like something a drama teacher would have a wank to. Following the opening experiment, the series then settles into Inside Number no. 9's more traditional pattern of episodes with intense characters and twists and turns with Simon Says, which is essentially an updated version of Misery. A huge fan of a sci-fi series called Ninth Circle gets footage of the show's creator involved in an altercation with a fan where he accidentally kills him. And the fan then uses this to blackmail him into writing a new series that undoes the controversial final episode that aired the year before. Simon Says is a phenomenal piece of work that fully explores this sense of ownership that fans have been allowed to indulge in much more now because of the outlets that have been given to us by the internet. You know I'm a sucker for media that critically analyses the culture of obsessive fandom that I come from, so obviously I love this one. The reason that Misery worked so well was because it played on the fact that creators don't know who the fans are. Anyone can be absorbing your work, and if they take your work too seriously, there can be consequences for that. Annie was a lonely and isolated woman, but if this was done nowadays, in the age of the internet, these people can be instantly connected over their shared love of a franchise, and they can, and in some cases do, take that love far too seriously. Simon Says was clearly inspired by recent incidents, like that stupid petition to get the creators and cast and crew of Game of Thrones to go so far as to remake the final season because everyone hated it so much. Simon Says is basically a more drastic version of that. 
And the episode even goes so far as to illustrate just how little control the creator really has in this situation. By having him succumbing to the request to undo the final episode and everybody loves it and demands more. There are many, many more Annie Wilkes out there now and they're talking to each other. They're making their podcasts. They're running their fan polls. They know your work better than you do. And they will get what they think they deserve. Episode 3 is called Lip Service, and it's another good one. It spends most of its runtime blending genres together in an effort to throw the viewer off guard. There's bits of farce in there, bits of romantic comedy, bits of high emotional drama, but at its core, it's an economically told erotic thriller about a man who can't accept that his partner's moved on without him, who pays for a lip reader to watch her and confirm his worst fear that she's found someone else. At first glance, it may appear to be a case of Inside Number 9 building a sort of straight-faced drama around a weird and obtuse image. Like with Last Gasp from Series 1 about the pop star whose breath gets caught in a balloon, the very singular image here is the woman lip-reading through the binoculars. But Lip Service is actually more like Riddle of the Sphinx, where it's got these layers of the story that are peeled away one by one with each twist. It fleshes out the scenario in a way that seems believable. Man hires a lip reader to spy on his cheating wife, but then it peels that away to reveal that the husband and the wife aren't actually together anymore. But then it peels that away to reveal that the lip reader hasn't actually been honest about why she's there, or what she's even been watching through the window. And the viewer then has that false sense of security as they believe the story is about to become a tale of these two people meeting under strange circumstances and falling in love, before peeling that away and pointing to the one detail that we all missed the entire time. The wife was meeting with a political troublemaker. And that's the reason the lip reader's there. Episode 4 is called Hurry Up and Wait. An actor on a TV production that's using a real-life kidnapping case that was reported nearby has to use as a green room a caravan owned by a strange family who may or may not know something about the kidnapping case. The family are weird and quirky and spend most of the runtime making the actor feel visibly uncomfortable with all these light hints that maybe they were involved in the case where the kid went missing. This episode is most reminiscent of Shearsmith and Pemberton's earlier project, The League of Gentlemen. The characters are cartoonish and over the top and deliver lines that are clearly meant to elicit laughs, but they are nervous laughs intended to cover a darker subtext. Of course, given there is this framework of the TV production, just like with Simon Says and Wuthering Heist, it's another case of Series 6 being metatextual, and this one examines the way that actors process their subject matter. People often see acting as a case of person shows up, says lines, goes home at the end of the day, but in order to convey emotions that the audience believes, the process actually requires the actor to fabricate a level of sincere belief in the material. And here we got a case of an actor finding himself sinking into the material over the course of an uncomfortable afternoon of shooting. And this guy's only got a bit part, he's only on screen for a few seconds. I did really enjoy this one, but the twist about what actually happened to the little boy in the end didn't hit nearly as hard as the reveal of what James's role actually ends up being in the broadcast episode, which just made me burst out laughing. It's an effective punchline to 25 minutes worth of build-up. Hurry Up and Wait is this really nice commentary on just how much stress goes into something so small and ultimately pathetic. Episode 5, How Do You Plead, is a pure horror piece and marks the return of Derek Jacobi to the series. Jacobi plays a chronically ill barrister who's hiding a dark secret from his past that explains why he's had such a successful career in which he's managed to get criminals off the hook for terrible crimes. Meanwhile, his carer, played by Shearsmith, drops all of these slight hints that he has an equally dark secret of his own. How Do You Plead has got this nice and slow build-up where we've just got Shearsmith and Jacoby playing off each other, prodding bits of backstory out of each other and building up a bigger picture, and it plays with the viewer's sense of trust. The viewer is treated as the jury, and the episode is essentially a trial for both of these characters. Your first impressions might be one of sympathy for the barrister in spite of his spiky persona, and you might see Urban as ultimately a decent man who sacrifices personal life for the sake of his job, but as more hints about their pasts get dropped, you begin to realise that these are fragile frameworks that they've built up to avoid their own guilt and the truth coming out. It's about this duality that both the barrister and the carer have to maintain to be able to live with themselves. The barrister's success comes at the expense of his physical health, while the carer feels that he has to have an unfulfilling lifestyle in which he feels he has to put everyone else's needs above his own at every single juncture because he feels that he has to atone for his past actions. The only real problem I had with it was that I was kind of taking How Do You Plead as a straight drama for the bulk of it. 
Jacobi and Shearsmith's characters are so richly textured that the out-and-out -out reveal of the supernatural influence at the end of the story kind of felt a bit silly and blunt to me. Though that is a testament to just how well constructed the backstories are, and also Jacobi just fucking owns any production that he's in. He's amazing in this. The final episode is Last Night of the Proms, and I'm probably going to be alone in saying that it's my favourite of Series 6. I love Simon Says, and Lip Service is clearly the most functionally sound and will be the most widely appealing, but I just love this one so much because anyone who follows me on Twitter know that I basically tweet nothing but cat pictures and Brexit jokes. Last Night of the Proms paints this portrait of a deeply dysfunctional family full of drama and conflict, but they use the shroud of English culture to avoid talking about any of it. The use of the proms is a really clever framing device because it highlights how this moment of family bonding over culture, like the songs themselves, is a performance. They pretend to cry over what these songs are supposed to mean, but they're just putting all this on to hide the fact that their relationships cannot be maintained. We've got cheating partners, marriages breaking down, irreconcilable political differences, a child being fucked up by his dysfunctional parents, and you can't really hide all of that by waving a bunch of flags around. Something will break and shatter this illusion eventually, and of course, it does. The thing that arrives to break the illusion is completely fucking stupid, of course. A homeless man breaks into their house and, through a series of contrivances, makes it look as though he's the second coming of Jesus. The family take everything out of context because they're so wrapped up in their own dramas and maintaining their facades, and the man ends up accidentally getting killed by the dementia-suffering granddad. I really was waiting for one of them to shout, THE ARISTOCRATS, at the end of the episode, by the way. I know that people are going to call this one on the nose, and yes, I do agree it is, and like with Wuthering Heist, it can be quite annoying, and yes, the situation that gets out of hand is completely ludicrous. There is a lot to criticise, but personally, the characters themselves did feel very real to me, and I slowly found myself getting suckered into their world over the course of one wild evening. So yeah, all in all, Inside Number 9 is clearly not out of ideas yet. Even when the show doesn't quite hit as hard as usual, it's a truly unique beast, and as ever, I cannot wait to see what they do next.